In our exercise, the Southeast Asia heat map, we see that China is the leading development partner to, to Southeast Asia. But the reality is that we've seen a decreasing trend of its, uh, of its financing going to the region. Um, and so it means that, you know, over the whole period, China is leading. But like in 2021, actually, you have the Asian Development Bank, the World Bank, or even Japan that are providing more uh, volumes of development finance to the region. And I think the, 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 um, the fall of uh, China's development finance to Southeast Asia can be explained by three factors. Uh, the first one is that, you know, China is actually facing an economic slowdown at home. And so I think Beijing prefers to um, allocate um, resources domestically rather than internationally. Um, the second thing is that, you know, China is actually facing some uh, obstacles in the implementation of some of its mega projects in Southeast Asia, such as the Jakarta to Bandung high-speed rail or the, um, the another high-speed rail in Malaysia. Um, and those challenges have actually been uh, even more uh, important during uh, the pandemic where, you know, international border closures and uh, health restrictions on the ground meant that Chinese, uh, Chinese workers couldn't actually go on, uh, on the ground and implement those projects. And I think the third factor I would mention is that, you know, over the years we've seen that China has been providing loans to many developing countries, but now there are some countries that are struggling to pay back those loans. And I think um, in uh, Southeast Asia, one of the most uh, apparent case is in Laos. Uh, the Laosian government has already asked twice the Chinese government to push back the debt. And so I think um, now Beijing is becoming more and more cautious as to like, the provision of its uh, development finance. If China is pulling back, Alexandre, then who is stepping up? Yes. So, um, as I explained at the beginning, you know, like the reason why China is, uh, is falling back is, you know, uh, mostly because of domestic reasons, but also like region that I have to see with the economic situation on the ground, um, and also mostly because some of its uh, its aid workers couldn't implement projects on the ground. Um, what we've seen is that uh, the multilateral development banks, so the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, and the World Bank, have really stepped up during the the pandemic because they have provided uh, what we call direct budget support. So really, they have injected uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of financing flows directly in the Treasury or directly in the economies of Southeast Asia to help them uh, with, to help the government of Southeast Asia with uh, public expenditures. And so this was actually a very, welcoming, uh, a very welcoming aspect, if you want, of like the reactivity of what we call the traditional development partners. Japan has done the same as well. Um, Australia has done the same as well, um, but to uh, to a smaller extent. So give us a sense when you're talking of Australia of what Australia's role is as a funder. Yeah. So in our analysis, uh, you know, we're ranking development partners by order of magnitude in terms of volume of funding that they're giving to the region. And so Australia for us is what we call the mid-sized development partner. So on our ranking, we're ranking 97 different development partners, and Australia ranks eight in this in this uh, in this scale. Um, you know, we're far uh, we're far behind uh, China, we're far behind Japan and Korea. Um, and so the interesting thing with uh, what we've done over the, over the years is that our aid program to Southeast Asia has actually been decreasing. Um, it's been decreasing up to 2020 when the pandemic arrived. And, um, and actually one interesting thing looking at Australia's reaction is that we were one of the most reactive during the pandemic. Uh, we've tripled our aid budgets, uh, notably because of like, the provision of a massive um, $1.5 billion loan to uh, Indonesia. And, and so, you know, like we are, I think by, by providing this kind of financing, we are showing that we're still relevant. But I think if we really want to be ambitious, uh, we will need to look at other ways to, to provide financing in the region. We're mostly providing grants. And now we will have to look at ways to, you know, provide other type of financing, such as loans or um, equities or guarantees. And I think the government is actually going through a development finance review at the moment and a development review as well. And so, you know, the opportunities are ripe for, for Australia to step, uh, to step in the region. And you've floated the idea of Australia really providing money for in infrastructure projects, that that would be a very positive move for countries in the region. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, infrastructure is definitely one of the region's largest and most important need. Um, you know, it takes forever to go from uh, one country to another in, in, in train. And, you know, like we're seeing really um, Japan and China investing in those large infrastructure, um, uh, transport, uh, tra transport infrastructure uh, projects. But also the region uh, needs a lot of energy, uh, um, a lot of energy provision. And so China is investing in hydropower, Japan as well, we could step ahead and do the same, you know, like, um, so we're talking about the Sassy Stage in my point, which is this project that, I've, that we're releasing today. In the past, I've worked on this project called the Pacific Aid Map um, that looked at, you know, uh, Australia's influence in, in, in the Pacific. And one of the things that, has, that is like boosting our role in the Pacific is the, cr the creation of uh, an infrastructure financing facility for the Pacific, which means that now, like, we can invest in large infrastructure projects through loans. And I think we should be doing, we should try to to be doing the same in, in Southeast Asia as well. Yeah. And talking of um, the Pacific study, climate aid was important in the way you looked at that map. What sort of factors are at play in Southeast Asia when it comes to climate? Yeah, so you're right. Like in, in uh, this Southeast Asia aid map, we're tracing what we call climate development finance. Um, and what we've seen is actually encouraging. We've seen that the trend of development finan of finance over the years have actually increased steadily. And in 2021, I think there were two out of five projects were uh, climate related. Um, but uh, so that's the positive story, I guess. Um, the, the more nuanced one is the fact that, you know, um, We've seen that while the um, the financing of non-renewable uh, energy projects are like decreasing, we also see a decrease in renewable energy projects, and so this goes in contradiction with you know the the, the need of in energy that the region has. So that's one aspect. The second aspect is that actually. Um, you know, uh, in our project, we look at, we look at what, the, what is the money that, uh, that is being spent, but we also look at what is the money that has been committed or promised. And so looking at those commitments gives us a good indication of the trends in the future, the trends to come. And what we've seen actually is that in climate, in climate development finance, the commitment has been decreasing steadily as well. And so to me, what it signals is that um, the, the outlook of climate, climate development finance in Southeast Asia is, is, is a bit mixed. Uh, really interesting stuff, Alexandra. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for having me, Beth.